So we'll get started as uh, everybody uh, is getting ready to uh, take a seat here. So good morning and welcome to uh, the Science Fix Symposium on Advances in Genome Editing in Hematopoietic Stem Cells. So this is uh, session 302 and it's organized by the Hematologic and Immunologic Gene and Cell Therapy Committee. So my name is Andre La Rochelle. I'm from the National Institutes of Health. My name is David Markusik. I'm from Indiana University. So just a centered uh, reminders to silence your cell phone and mobile devices this morning um, and to uh, take some time at the end of the sessions, each session, to fill out your evaluation using the cell phone app and the uh, clipboard, using the clipboard icon. All right, so on this we'll get started. Uh, so we have a great lineup of four speakers this morning will focus on genome editing in hematopoietic stem cells. So the discussion I think will be very exciting and spread a, a fairly large uh, breadth of, of concepts from basic concepts in DNA repair to promising preclinical data to clinical development and manufacturing for genome editing in hematopoietic stem cells. So the committee wanted to represent both uh, HR homology directed repair as well as non-homologous and joining repair-based strategies. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is what will be done with our four speakers. So the clinical potential of non-homologous and joining-based approaches will be demonstrated by Dr. Tony Ho for the treatment of uh, hemoglobinopathies and by Dr. Paula Rio for the treatment of Fanconi anemia. For homologous-directed uh, repair-based strategies, Dr. Nancy Maisel will discuss very innovative data on pathways of homologous recombination at DNA NICs and double strand breaks. And the clinical potential of uh, homologous recombination based strategies will be discussed by Dr. Suxi Deraven for uh, chronic granulomatous disease and also by Dr. Um, Rio for Fanconi anemia. So each speaker will present for about 25 minutes and will take uh, five minutes of questions directly after the, uh, each talk. So there will be no panel discussion at the end. All right, so on this, we'll get started with our first speaker, who is Dr. Tony Ho, who is um, Executive Vice President and Head of Research and Development at Crisp CRISPR Therapeutics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dr. Ho is a highly accomplished R&D leader with experience across all phases of R&D, including discovery, early and late stage clinical development, and regulatory throughout his nearly 20 years of career. So he joined um, CRISPR Therapeutic to oversee the company's global research and development efforts across all therapeutic areas. So Dr. Ho will present today an overview of the work that supported the development of the CTX-001 clinical trial application for beta thalassemia, including preclinical beta manufacturing and clinical development. So the title of his talk is Induction of Fetal Hemoglobin to Treat Beta Hemoglobinopathies, bring, Bringing CRISPR to the Clinic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for the organizer for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. It's my pleasure to tell you our story of bringing the first uh, company sponsor, uh, CRISPR uh, therapy, to the clinic. We are a publicly traded company, so the, uh, we have an obligatory forward-looking statement, and you can read it at your pleasure. CRISPR-Cas9 is a bacterial defense mechanism uh, that against uh, phage attack. It was uh, first described, and uh, our founder, Emmanuel Chapentier, has the insight on the importance of the tracer RNA and had the insight actually connecting the tracer RNA with the CRISPR RNA to form a single guided RNA. Along with Jennifer Duanat of UC Berkeley, they published the seminal paper in Science in 2012. This very efficient yet elegant system uh, has really revolutionized the ease of uh, doing gene editing. Um, you know, the easiest way to uh, use this method is used as, uh, uh, for disruption of the gene, and you can uh, through non homologous and joint um, uh, reactions. With two guys, you can also delete a segment of DNA, and uh, with the appropriate template, you can also replace uh, uh, um, a gene of interest using this method. CRISPR therapy day was founded in 2013 with the focus of bringing CRISPR-based therapy to the clinic. 
Our lead program is CTX-01 for beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. This is a 50-50 joint uh, development program with Vertex Therapeutic. And uh, we have filed the, the world first company sponsor CTA uh, end of the year last year and has already received one uh, approval for to begin clinical trial in human. Uh, following this, we also have a sickle program using CTX-01 and we intend to uh, have, uh, we're on track for the IND for uh, first half of this year. We also have a very large and growing uh, immune oncology portfolio, these including CTX-101, a anti-CD19 allergen A CAR T that we intend to file IND end of the year. Quickly following that, we have CTX120, an anti-BCMA allergen A CAR T, and CTX130, uh, an anti-CD70 allergen A CAR T. We are also continue to pursue additional in vivo applications of CRISPR-Cas9 system in liver and other organ system. Both uh, sickle cell and beta thalassemia are a disease of beta globin. In sickle cell disease, there's a point mutation which causes the um, sickle globin has a tendency to polymerize and sickle and block blood vessels. In beta thalassemia, because the deficiency in beta globin, uh, it causes excessive alpha toxicity and the short red re blood cell half life and necessary lifelong transfusion. It is a significant worldwide burden with more than 300,000 uh, uh, sickle cell baby born each year and more than 60,000 uh, beta cell uh, uh, baby are born each year. In, in normal adult hemoglobin, you have basically two alpha chain that is paired with two beta chain. And in beta thalassemia, what happens is that you have deficiency of the beta globin. Uh, either complete absence or uh, decreased level. This leads to excessive unpaired alpha toxicity. And the unpaired alpha is actually very toxic to the red blood cell membrane and causing the shorter half-life of these red blood cells. And because your bone marrow cannot keep up with the uh, loss of red blood cell, you will require a uh, lifelong trans, uh, transfusion. The lifelong transfusion actually then lead to iron overload and organ damages. Although uh, the transfusion iron collision uh, therapy advances in the past uh, uh, years has really improved this, they still represent significant morbidity and uh, early death for many of these patients. In sickle cell disease, because the single uh, nucleotide mutation, uh, and this will cause the sickle globin to polymerize and uh, uh, cause sickling of the red blood cell, and the sickling red blood cell can plug uh, the blood vessels and cause basically very painful vaso occlusive disease. And, uh, and certainly occlusion of these blood vessel can cause stroke, pulmonary tensions, acute chest syndrome, et cetera. And the, the pain of these vaso occlusive uh, disease can be uh, often described as even worse than uh, 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 giving birth to babies. Uh, these are, just imagine, every blood vessel is occluded and, 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 and uh, uh, causing the pain. It uh, costs more than 230,000 emergency visits every year and more than 70,000 hospitalization and $2 billion in medical costs. Despite uh, the advances uh, over the past year through uh, many of you here and, and also uh, um, NIH, uh, you know, that the um, lifespan of the sickle cell patient has improved dramatically uh, with uh, penicillin, appropriate pain management, supportive care, transfusion to prevent strokes, and uh, some uh, approved therapy, hydroxyurea and L-glutamine, although the efficacy of these agents is rather limited. The only cure for both beta cell and sickle cell disease are uh, uh, allogeneic uh, bone marrow transplant, but that's require often HOA matching, uh, and uh, so, so it's limited to only a small population. Uh, we know in both sickle cell and beta cell uh, uh, disease, 
These babies actually born quite asymptomatically when their fetal hemoglobin is high. And as their fetal hemoglobin is switching off, they start beginning to have symptoms. The question is, can we leverage this observation and re uh, uh, recreate this, uh, uh, elevate fetal hemoglobin to alleviate their symptoms? Nature has actually done this experiment for us. There are these rare uh, patients in these sickle and beta cell family where they, in addition to the beta cell thalassemia and sickle cell mutation, they have additional mutation that uh, actually uh, th does not turn off their fetal hemoglobin. As you can see in both graphs, uh, they can be actually quite asymptomatic. So our strategy is trying to recreate these uh, uh, basically experiment of nature using CRISPR-Cas system. We know that BCL1A is a, a very effective suppressor of fetal hemoglobin expression and it acts like a break for the system. So what we do is actually using CRISPR-Cas system and uh, disrupt the erythral enhancer region for uh, bcl 11 gene, and this way we have decreased uh, bcl 11 a and hopefully increase uh, fetal hemoglobin. And we actually uh, uh, has done this and uh, optimized several system, like uh, biological system, we can actually achieve very high uh, editing rate of more than 80%. And the nice thing about this system is that we simply electroporate a foreign scissor, the RMP, to the cells. And there's no translation, there's no uh, gene insertion in this. So with this one step process, we can actually achieve very little donor to donor variabilities. And in sickle cell disease, we know that the sickle globulin is, uh, has a tendency to polymerize under hypoxic conditions. And fetal hemoglobin is actually one of the best anti-cycling uh, globin out there. So when it's in there, it actually interferes with the problem polymerization of the sickle globin. Uh, so the goal is actually get this uh, in, you know, close to every cell. As you can see from our data, we can achieve 76% uh, of the cell has both copy of chromosome edited, and the cell actually has the highest level of fetal hemoglobin. Approximately 16% of the cell has one of the chromosomes uh, uh, edited, and these cells has uh, less but still clinically significant level of fetal hemoglobin. And that leave less than 10% of the cells are unedited and vulnerable to potential cycling. So with this, we believe, uh, and we also know that uh, the, the biallelic edited cell has sort of survival advantage over the monoallelic edited cells, and that monoallelic edited cell has survival advantage over unedited cells. So we believe with the, these edits, potentially we can functionally uh, cure these uh, uh, patients if we can uh, get almost all the cells edited. In beta cell, on the other hand, the problem is alpha toxicity. We know from uh, um, very old studies actually show that the RBC half-life is really very proportional to degree of alpha pairing. When there's complete uh, absence of beta globin or unpairing of uh, alpha globin, the red blood cell only live one to two days. And of course, your bone marrow cannot keep up with that kind of loss and that, that would necessitate lifelong transfusion. And we know when you're a carrier, and you have more than 50% pairing, the RBC half-life now is more 60 to 70 days. With that kind of half-life, your bone marrow can keep up with replacing the loss of red blood cell and don't need transfusion and can become asymptomatic. So as you can see, uh, we can achieve this level of editing with uh, CTX001. Of course, uh, you probably hear quite a bit about potential off-target of CRISPR-Cas system. And that's really dependent on the quality of your guide RNA. Just like any barcode readers, if your code is promiscuous, you will cut multiple places. The key is to find that guide that is very precise. And this is really no different than small molecule development 
where you screen for molecule with high efficiency and low, low off-target activities. So we start out with more than 1,000 guy RNA that's uh, uh, evaluated in silico, then biologically evaluate both on and off-target. And that narrowed down to 10 guy RNA where we do a much more deeper analysis. Uh, there are two things we do. One is homology-based, where we use the, the sequence to predict potential off-target site, up to five mismatches. In addition, using GuideSeq, we also look at more than 2,000 sort of empiric homology independent sites and to make sure the, uh, there's no off-target cutting above the background. As you can see, we actually, our uh, select guy has uh, no off-target above background. Another important thing you want to make sure in these type of editing is that you are editing the CD34 long-term hematopoietic stem cells. And as you can see, we have uh, equal amount of editing across all the cell type and uh, the long-term hematopoietic stem cells are edited like other cell types. And we can also see that uh, in terms of the pattern of the edit, diversity edit, they uh, appear to be similar across the board. And these edit cells in the NSG model, uh, they can differentiate in all cell lineage, including B cell, T cell, and myelo cells. We also did additional uh, GLP talk studies uh, to support the CTX01 safety. Uh, and uh, that basically we show that there's no evidence of tumor genicity and uh, no evidence for any uh, general toxicity. Uh, there's also no impact in terms of cell biodistribution patterns. Our clinical trial basically will be consisted of uh, the following. The patient will be apheresis uh, after uh, either single agent or dual agent mobilization, the cell will then be shipped uh, to the central manufacturing facility. The CD34 cell will be isolated, then basically electroporated uh, uh, and with CRISPR-Cas9 system. And uh, these cells then uh, cryopreserved and tested and released for, uh, for treatment. The patient then select basically the right day for them and uh, uh, undergo myeloablative conditioning to free up spaces for these uh, edited cells. Then we infuse ctx one to uh, these patients and uh, uh, watch for engraftment and uh, immune reconstitutions. And we will follow these patients uh, up um, for two years. And uh, in addition to that, we have 15-year long-term follow-up. So, of course, we're not going to stop there, bringing the first uh, CRISPR-based therapy to the clinic. We uh, leverage our experience in terms of the CD34 hematopoietic uh, stem cells. Now we're actually learning from those using a similar technology, building up our uh, immuno-oncology pipeline, these including the CTX101 for CD19 that we're going to be following for IND at the end of the year, and CTX120 for the BCMA, and CTX 130 uh, for CD70. So I'll stop there, and uh, I'd like to thank all the CRISPR and Vertex uh, colleagues that has uh, sort of dedicated their time to make this possible, and we're looking forward to those, the first patient. Thank you very much. Okay, we can uh, start with some questions. Please use the microphones. Okay, um, I work with inbred mice, so I don't have to really worry about the genetic background. Are you working with autologous cells, or and where do you get your CD34 cells from? The reason I ask is each human is different, and I'm wondering about how you look for off-target in each different human if you use their own cells. Yes, so um, we certainly, th this is our, first of all, this is autologous therapy, and uh, when we designed this guy, we, we look for uh, SNP variabilities, for entering void area that, um, that have common SNP. So we first look at that. And uh, certainly, this is something we will be looking at as we're doing more and more patients. Yeah. But so far, what we're seeing is that for all the donors we see, it's very consistent. Thank you. So I'll have one question. So there's been a couple of publications uh, deposited in BioArchive regarding 
community to Cas9. Is this, uh, so what, what's your thoughts uh, about this, that some, a large proportion of the population uh, has or seems to have um, immunity to Cas9 that could compromise these trials? Yeah, that's certainly, uh, it's not surprisingly because this is a bacterial uh, system and uh, you get to expose to strep and staph all the time. Um, for this ex vivo therapy, it's actually not an issue because actually by the time we infuse these cells into a uh, human, there's no Cas9 and there's no guy RNA. So there's nothing uh, there to, for, for the immune to attack. Uh, that the, the immunity you mentioned is really uh, could be a potential issue for in vivo application. And certainly uh, I know other company and also us are uh, looking at that very carefully. It's really no different than AAV where, uh, you know, the nice thing about CRISPR-Cas is as, actually this is a, what we are doing is very transient, which is a, it's a transient system. Although the Cas9 peptides can also be uh, eventually presented at the surface of the cells and could be uh, recognized by the immune system. I mean, that's certainly uh, what has been proposed in these uh, publications. Yeah. Something to consider. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? And could you give us a little bit more details on the um, approaches that you're using for electroporation? What instrument you use? And is it mostly RNP or mRNA or both? Yeah, so we, we have not disclosed what instrument we use. Uh, and. Um, uh, we are ex electroporating RMP because uh, th we, we feel this is actually an advantage uh, in that uh, that gives us the highest consistency because this is just like any other biological process. If you, you know, take lentivirus, for example, um, lentivirus, you need insertions, you need translation, you need to make sure, make sure it's not silenced. So multiple uh, steps give you quite a bit of variability. And that's why when we do it, a single RMP actually give it very low donor-to-donor -donor variability. And, and that's why uh, we would pick that method. Okay. So I have one quick question. Uh, I'm not necessarily an expert in the field, but could you comment on why you're using myoablative conditioning as opposed to non-myoablative, since you don't necessarily need to have a high level of engraftment for correction? Yes, certainly it would be ideal not to use a myeloablative um, condition, but um, given this is a pretty novel therapy, and Bluebird actually has uh, blazer trail, you know, we, we decided not to take that risk uh, at this current stage of development and really follow uh, sort of similar type of uh, clinical trial design they have and to see, you know, uh, uh, using a myeloablative. And the thinking is that you know, you basically need to make space. There's kind of competition for these uh, uh, stem cell niches, and that's kind of like musical chair. You, you, you want as many cell and graph as possible and reduce the endogenous unedited cells. Thank you. As a, I don't know if this is on. As a follow-up to that, um, I see that you're retaining a lot of the, uh, the high proportion of edited cells, but what actually engraftment do you see in the, in the NSG mice of the edited cells? I, you, you showed data that you're getting a, retaining a high proportion of edited cells, but what levels of engraftment are you getting in the mice? Yeah, we're uh, basically, actually uh, I should have put that graph in. Basically we have shown no difference in internal engraftment compared to control versus edited cells. Yeah, that's a very good question. Any other questions? No? Okay, well thank you again for your okay. talk. Thank you.